This is the conspiratorial view of history, as opposed to the accidental view. And it is the conspiratorial view that we shall present in this program. There is a conspiracy theory that a shadowy elite of international bankers are secretly controlling the governments of the world. They say that the people that control this world could sit around one large table and have lunch. The theory goes that these elitists plan to create an all-powerful new world order, a world government that will destroy anyone who disobeys them. It is a theory shared by militiamen and neo-Nazis, and also by an increasing number of mainstream Americans. The message spreads through underground videos and anti-New World Order talk shows. Is there a new world order? There's a new world order. Is there a new religion coming? A new religion's coming. The new world odor has a certain smell about it. The smell of death. This is the story of a family who wanted to escape from the clutches of this tyrannical elite by moving to a mountaintop in Idaho. It is also the story of how their paranoid fantasies came true. Are you proud of yourself? Are you proud of yourself? You're going to kill all the children to get what? I guess I wouldn't give up what I had in my childhood for anything. Like when I was little, I would go out and I could sit and watch, you know, a wasp dig a hole in the ground for hours. And then I'd follow it and it'd go paralyze a worm or a cricket or something and it'd drag it into its hole. But the media just portrayed that we were all crazy and had landmines everywhere and all we cared about was guns, I guess. But. I mean, I do, I do like guns. I still do, and I did then too. But I mean, it's not it's not weird or crazy. When Rachel Weaver was two years old in the mid 1980s, her parents, Randy and Vicky, moved the family from Iowa City to a mountaintop in Idaho, a place that became known as Ruby Ridge. Randy and Vicky were conspiracy theorists. They believed that an evil elite of international bankers and media moguls was secretly controlling their increasingly tyrannical government. The move to the cabin was their way of opting out. Am I hitting it at all, guys? to kind of get out of the regular system and want to find a place where we could teach the kids at home, uh, get them out of the city and out of the public school system, like government schools, what I call them. And, you know, kids in the city grow up with basketballs and bicycles, and kids in the mountains or out in the country grow up with dogs and guns. It isn't about hunting or target shooting. It's for protection against a government that can become tyrannical. Describe the feeling of what it's like to shoot a gun. I don't know. See, I really fell in love with this, this one gun. It's called a 4570, but it has a really, it's not a hard kick, it's a lug, like lugs you back. I don't know, I think I, uh, that's what I enjoy most about that gun. The reason why I don't look at it as a big political thing is because even if I had, you know, my rifles, it's not like it's going to do me any good if the government wants to wipe me out. All I have to do is fly over in a helicopter and drop a firebomb, you know, but as far as trying to go up against the government, that's just, unless the whole country did it, I guess, <laughs> but that'd be a little different. This used to be one of my mom's favorite songs. It's that, uh, counting flowers on the wall, that don't bother me at all, that, you know, The Weaver family moved to the mountains because they were panicked by the underground videos they saw portraying their government as out of control and destroying the lives of simple people who wanted to live free. When the guns are gone and your freedom lies shattered at your feet, 
Just when it will be far too late to save, why didn't I fight instead of sheepishly retreat? Oh. The family called this shadowy elite the New World Order. They thought that if they couldn't be left alone on top of a mountain in Idaho, where could they be left alone? Some of the things they believed up there might seem crazy, but they were a long way off. Is this your land now? Yeah. Yeah, we've been on my land for a little while. This is it. it. Used to be an outhouse and a woodshed and stuff like right here. Our shed where that they confiscated for the evidence used to be about right where that outhouse is. And this is what's left of the house. All the way up to here, I guess, was the living room, and then we had the kitchen and um, about right here is where our front door was. Uh, sink was over here on the side. And then above the kitchen was mom and dad's bedroom. And then over on that side, above the right-hand part of the living room was Sarah and I's bedroom, and then on the left was Sam's bedroom. There was Rachel, her parents, her older sister Sarah, and their brother Sam. Later on, Vicky would give birth to a baby, Elisheba, up there. We'd build tree forts and little huts and use old dead branches, and sometimes we'd make a little dug, you know, make a little dugout and hide behind that and play war games. And I remember using some of the leaves off the bushes as play money and going to the store where there would be like, it was really make-believe. <laughs> Tell me about war games. <laughs> just, <laughs> just kind of cowboy. Yeah, just kind of cowboy Indian type things. I believe in searching for, quote, the truth about politics, religion, whatever. I like just to discuss that with people. We always sat around and talked about stuff. I mean, that was like kind of the family, you know, pastime or, I mean, because we were always together, so we always talked about stuff. One place the Weavers went to discuss politics was Aryan Nations, a hardcore neo-Nazi compound 70 miles from the cabin. Aryan Nations hold summer camps every year, and Randy used to visit, sometimes taking the children along. Aryan Nations are very specific about who they feel is in charge of the New World Order. Who do you believe is in charge of the New World Order? Well, it's the Antichrist Jew. Same one that murdered Abel. Do you think all Jews, or just some Jews? Just oh, all Jews. Jews. In other words, it's a blood order. DNA has proven it. But even though quite a lot of the people in power aren't Jewish. No, not, you're say, what you're saying is uh, they are trying to say that they're not Jewish. But all the, the Rothschilds and the Bilderbergers and, and all the rest of them are racially Jews. We don't really care what religion they have adopted over the centuries, but as a race, they're Jews. So what, all, all As soon as a Jew marries into a white person's you know, family, the offspring are Jewish. They just perform every evil on this planet. You know, they're behind every evil thing that goes on. And they control the banking system, and that's what you're talking about, world economics, and that's by, their, by that means to control the world. The Weaver family were never as hardcore in their beliefs as the people at Aryan Nations. Randy and Vicky were not obsessed with hating Jews. They were not white supremacists. But they liked the neo-Nazis as people, shared their hatred for the government, and enjoyed their picnic areas and summer camp activities. What I remember is things like the candy hunts and, and meeting friends in the playground and sitting around a table and, you know, if we'd meet someone new, we'd hear new stories or something, or old friends would exchange new stories or... Oh, sorry. <laughs> the candy hunts. Um, I can't think what you call those. What do you, what do you call that when you, you find... Treasure hunts. Yes, treasure hunts. <laughs> I didn't feel about them ever maybe being a hardcore, I'm going to run up to the area of nations and sing Heil, you know, so... Even though they did do that once in a while. Well, apparently. Well, I uh, suppose you could visit. I mean, people have curiosities, and... But I suppose you could go to investigate and see what they were like and not be like them. It was at Aryan Nations that the Weavers' problems began. The U.S. government had infiltrated the compound, hoping to recruit some of the less hardcore members as undercover informants. 
they asked Randy to become one. Randy said, no, I don't want to do it. You know, I moved out of the city, up on top of this mountain, because you guys are all rotten. I don't want to work with you. I know what you're up to. I don't want to be a part of it. Go away. So then the government, as it is today, decided you can't say no to God, our government, so now we're going to make you serve us. So they sent a infiltrator in that was a, a snitch for the federal government to become friends with Randy. And you know the story about asking him to sh to saw off two shotguns. First he said machine guns. I said, I can't get to no machine guns. <laughs> he says, well, how about sawed off shotguns? They're real good. I go, oh, well, no problem. That's easy. He grabs his, his file and he files it. You know, he saws the barrels off, not knowing he's violating federal law. I totally don't understand why they even came to my dad to ask him to saw off shotguns. It makes no sense to me. It just blows my mind that they didn't even care. But for the government, Randy had the makings of a perfect undercover informant, a slightly crazy person who was friends with far crazier people, a family man with bad finances. How could he turn them down? In fact, Randy made a big show of turning them down. Mr. Weaver, we can get you on six or seven federal firearm violations, but we'd probably forego that if you'd join our team. And I just kind of, I don't think so. And he just come clear across the seat and got right in my face. He says, well, that's the way we do it, right? He says, tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock, you'll be down in Spokane Federal Building, and uh, don't tell anybody you're coming, don't, not even your wife. About that time, Vicky come walking out of the cabin by me. I said, hey, Vic, come here. She walked over the truck and said, remember their names and faces. And they go, we got to go. Peeled out of the gravel, <laughs> throwing rocks, took off. They knew I wasn't coming down to Spokane the next day. <laughs> Randy was indicted on the shotgun charge, feeling that he'd been coerced into committing a crime by a tyrannical government controlled by the New World Order. He decided not to show up in court. The family buried their heads in the sand. Randy let it be known that he would not be taken off the mountain alive. A family friend called Kevin Harris moved in with them. I knew I was going to lose. They had me set up, uh, white supremacist, gun runner, blah, 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 and those people that they put on juries in North Idaho are the local brainwashed county, city fathers and mothers that will suck up and do it. If the government told them to go down Monday morning and get a walking license and pay 10 bucks a year for it, they'd do it. From then on, I never left that property. Pretty neat view, huh? It was as if Randy and Vicky's conspiracy theories were coming true. They had moved to the mountains to escape a tyrannical government, and a tyrannical government was now coming to get them. The family took to carrying guns at all times, even the children. They became increasingly convinced that the army of the New World Order was watching them from the bushes. In fact, they were being watched from the bushes. I have to remember, they were under surveillance after a period of time because um, Randy tried to apprehend Randy previously and not been successful. But were I closeted up on the mountain with just my family and already feeling persecuted and I know someone's watching me, <laughs> my paranoia is going to increase, whether I think it's going to or not. See, most, you know, most paranoid people think they're being watched and they're not. All right. Here was somebody who's They were actually watched being watched, you know, so, yeah, they're, then, so they're on a high alert. You know? So any little thing that, that occurs becomes a big thing. Can you hear that? Somebody's on their way up. Oh, see, now if we were out at the rock, I could run out and see who it is. Somebody going up higher. It's too overgrown for me to see, but they're already on their way up. And that's what we do every time we heard somebody. Jeez. Something so simple can bring back the excitement. <laughs> then the marshals come because he's avoiding arrest. They're not going to just walk away and say, oh, well, sure, you don't want to be arrested. We'll see you around. <laughs> you know. Uh, and you can't dispute the fact the man had a sawed-off shotgun and he tried to sell it to an undercover agent. You can call it entrapment or whatever you want, but he did it. Due to the remoteness of his location in the mountain, um, it was decided that we just kind of take a, a wait and see uh, attitude because, uh, again, he had three kids up there and um, the oh. last thing we wanted to, well, the baby did came along later and maybe in retrospect waited too long. Uh, of course, time went on and a year went on and the last thing that the Marshal Service wanted to do was to um, get into a situation where kids could get involved. 
and then it still fell apart. I don't have a lot of memories about me and Sam because we never really hung out together. One thing is, the day before everything happened, he had gone down to collect the seeds from his radish plants because they were really huge, just really good radishes and he was going to plant some next year. Well, I followed him down there to, to talk to him and watch him or whatever. And he's all, you know, leave me alone, quit following me, whatever. And I went behind this blown over tree where the root was really big and I, I was sitting there crying. And he came over and apologized to me and said he loved me and everything. And, and uh, I guess that's what I remember most about him because he had never said anything like, like that to me. The Marshalls were up there doing the same thing they'd been doing off and on for the last three months. They had cameras up there. Uh, of course, Randy had found one of the cameras um, and had destroyed it. And uh, they got too close to the cabin. And uh, the dogs uh, uh, got a scent of them. And uh, the dogs started chasing. The deputies started running down the hill. And uh, then the shots were fired. If I'd had any idea that these federal marshals were doing, they was out there dinking around, I'd have never, I wouldn't have gone out there myself, but I sure as hell wouldn't have let Sam and Kevin go running chasing that dog after federal marshals. I mean, that'd be stupid. That'd be stupid. But, so I get, I go down this logging road, down to the area they call the Y. I hear, clunk, clunk, clunk. I look, and here's this guy jumps out in front of me total camel doubt. I mean, just, I saw his eyes and I saw his mouth move and he yelled, freeze, Weaver. I said, you. I was yelling for the boys. Boys, get home, get home, boys. It's an ambush, right? I heard Sam yell, I'm coming, Dad. Boom, 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 boom. Then it opened up. The deputy started running down the hill. Um, Randy Kevin Harris and Sammy Weaver started chasing them down. The dogs started coming down. They got to a Y. The deputies stopped and shots got fired. Um, the dog was definitely shot. One of the agents shot Stryker in the back and hit his spine and little uh, Samuel who raised the dog from a pup saw him run around in circles yiping and then fall dead. Sammy opened fire on the agents that had shot his dog and said, you guys you killed my dog, and he opened fire and shot, shot several times. And as it turned out, he didn't hit anybody. But uh, then when he, they, they of course fired back at him with military rifles, these uh, automatic fire rifles, and almost cut his left arm off. Now remember, he was about the size of a 10-year-old boy, you know, small. Uh, so they shot his left arm to where it was just hanging by the flesh and little Samuel turned around and ran up the mountain and screamed to his dad, I'm coming home, dad. And at that time, my fellow officers took a MP5 machine gun and just sprayed him right up the back as he's run away and murdered him right there. One of the U.S. Marshals, Bill Deegan, was also killed in the gunfight that followed Sammy's death. We were all standing up on that rock that overlooks our driveway and it was just uh, um mom and sarah and i and dad was up there with us by now we um we just let out the, a cry and just broke down and i remember dad fired mom's 223 into the air full clip. So, I mean, what happened after that? Mom, I think it was right after that, Mom said we gotta go get him. And so Mom and Dad went down, and Kevin went with them. And I went in the house and got Elizabeth dressed. And I, I never saw him. They put him in the guest shed, and Dad and Mom went in and cleaned him up and wrapped him in a sheet, I guess. It's a bad deal. You know, the, I didn't give a shit about nothing after that. I still don't, pretty much. See, I don't, I don't remember days. To me, it's just all one, one, it's like one long bad day. 
Vicky Weaver wrote in her diary that night that Sam was killed while chasing the servants of the New World Order. A US Marshal had been killed, so his team called for backup. A 400-strong army descended on the cabin. They sealed off the mountain. Two miles away, down in the valley, the neighbours began a protest at the roadblock. Martial law was declared by the state governor, who called the Weaver cabin an extreme emergency and disaster area. Good afternoon. A federal agent has been shot and killed in a confrontation with a fugitive in North Idaho. We started listening to the news that night. Oh, crazy bastards, you know, white supremacists murder U.S. Marshal. Yeah, right. We murdered him. Yeah, wrong. This is a big deal now. Crazy white supremacist and you got a dead cop. Whoa, whoa, this cop is worth more than my son? I don't think so. He ain't even worth more than my dog. Were you aware of just how many troops turned up after that? Oh, hell no. The military operation was undertaken with such stealth that besides from hearing a few sirens down in the valley, the Weaver family had no idea that their cabin was now surrounded by FBI snipers. I think it's one of these things that a uh, couple agent friends of mine, when we get together for lunch, it never fails. This comes up at every lunch. And it, well, I wonder if we would have done this, or well, did, you know, who said that, or why was that done, or... And what about the rules of engagement? You know, can we look back today and say those rules shouldn't have been that way? Sure, we can do that today. And what were the rules? The rules engagement, there was four um, rules in there, but the main one, rule was that any adult armed male, uh, uh, it could be um, I can't remember the exact words to tell you the truth. Couldn't should be shot. You know, I'd have to read it again. They were extreme. As some people would say a lot of things went wrong up there. Well, you know, I won't disagree with that. Everything um, that probably could have went wrong did go wrong. The next day, the other two dogs that we had tied up out in the yard started kind of whimpering and barking a little bit. And I thought, yep, here they come. Somebody's out there wants to talk to us. I took Sam's Mini 14, and I walked out, and bang, I got shot through the shoulder. It's like a bloody mist went out across the front of my face. I smelled that, and it went. I cussed in my mind, you know, like this. You know, this really hurts. And then I got my bearings, and I went through my mind. They're going to murder me now. They're going to kill me now. We're up on the hill, just about straight across from where the house was, where Horiuchi was apparently placed strategically. That was the sniper. Mm-hmm. You can see very clearly, well, at least I know where the house was, but I can see everything real clearly from here. You can see that old cook stove laying on the platform right now. If I can see that, and he had a scope, I know he could see a lot more. He first took a shot at my dad and hit him in the back, came out through his armpit, and uh, then as they were running into the house, he shot my mother, and it went through her head and killed her, and it, the bullet then entered Kevin Harris. Where was your mother at the time? Uh, standing right about where that cook stove is. It'd be about exactly where she was. She was holding my little sister, who was 10 months old at the time. So Vicky goes to the door while she's nursing little Alicia, pushes the door open frantically because she hears a gunfire. And here comes the whole family running in the door. The bullet had come through the window in the door. Would have went through Vicky's face here and come out this, or let's see, she was facing that way. Would have come in here, out here, right over the baby's head and into Kevin. Kevin's coming in, it went in his left arm. And, uh, the main part of the bullet broke two, two ribs and, and uh, stopped about this far from his heart. So that was an excellent shot, but a very sad day for America. 
when uh, one of my fellow officers and soldiers has to shoot a mother holding her little baby. I turn around, there's Vicky. She's kind of down in a, on her knees and her head. I think it was Dad picked Elishba up out from underneath Mom and handed her to me. And she had, um, she had blood and stuff all over her head, and we were afraid that she had gotten hit too, but she was okay. It was just, it was just Mom's blood. And that's when we went around and drew the curtains on all the windows. Um, and shut the door, obviously, and we didn't come out after that. The family locked themselves in the cabin for over a week. Nobody but the Weavers and the FBI knew that Vicky had been killed. How many of you against one is there, huh? We want a head count. We want to know how many are still alive up there. I remember hearing, hearing people underneath the house rustling through our stuff. Uh, I remember the floodlights coming through the cracks of the curtains. And hearing, uh, they're stupid whatever they are, half tracks or whatever, rolling over stuff in the yard. They crunched our generator, they ran over our outhouse. Um, not to mention, down at the, at the Y where everything happened, after they shoot the dog and my brother, they, they ran over the dog. It's just sick. Two miles down in the valley, the protest at the roadblock had swelled to thousands. People traveled from across America to support the Weavers. Nobody can murder a 14-year-old boy. Uh, any adult in his right mind would never, ever agitate a 14-year-old boy into a mortal gunfight and justify it as right. There's just no way it can ever be justified as right in my book. I'm a father and I'm an American and I'm sick into my soul. Jack McLam and Bo Greitz were in the crowd. Jack and Bo are both ex-military officers who've jumped ship and become heroes to the anti-government activists. It was surreal. It was incredible. Uh, what we had was, I'd never seen so many FBI, DEA agents, U.S. Marshals, local police, state police in one place in my life. We had uh, armored personnel carriers and then they were all dressed in, in military uniforms with Kevlar. This is America. What is going on here? Every day they would shout at us through the, the, those, the bullhorn or loud thing, whatever you call it. And they'd say, Vicky, Vicky, tell Randy to pick up the phone. And Dad would scream out, you son of a bitch, you shot her or whatever. You know she's dead. And they'd never answer us. And I know they could hear through the walls. They were under the house, they were around the house, they were everywhere. How much will you take? How much will you compromise? What are you doing? How many dead you? patriots will you bury? But there were people who were who were holding up signs that said death to Zog. What does what does Zog mean? It means Zionist occupational government. And the neo-Nazis, Randy had attended their church a couple times and he didn't like it so he left and so they felt they would come to his aid and so they were there with their signs saying it was a Zionist occupational government was doing all this. It was a week into the siege. The FBI had failed to convince the Weavers to come out so they invited Jack and Bo up the mountain to talk with Randy and his daughters through the cabin walls. Bo Greitz and Jack McLam walking across the bridge across uh, Ruby Creek heading to Randy's mountain house. Later that night, Jack and Bo came back down the mountain to tell the protesters what they'd learnt. I want uh, all of you in the vigil to uh, join your hands. I want you to get close and I want you to get warm. I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is that uh, we went right up to the top of the hill and established an immediate dialogue like I knew we could with Randy. Wasn't any problem at all. This communication is going to continue. I want your hands joined. That's an order. 
I got a reason for it. The bad news, and get a grip on yourself, is that Vicky was killed. Oh, no. Damn. And uh, most unfortunate thing, apparently she was killed on Saturday. Wonderful mother. Just take part and take as had her life taken, and she's in God's hands as we speak. Our fathers may approach by throne tonight. We're thankful that some are left alive. We pray again tonight. Your blessing upon them that are the girls. Um, 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 our Father, we ask that you be with Kevin tonight and get him through. The spinning had begun in earnest. The FBI said that Randy might have shot his own son in the back. They said that the Weavers were white supremacists, that they lived in a mountain fortress or a heavily armed compound. The media reported these allegations as fact. At one point they said you had, like, bunkers and... Yeah, the root cellar. <laughs> yeah, they said this was a compound. That's why they could sneak up within 15 feet of us. <laughs> I came to a point in my mind that I, I knew we was all dead. And it's just a matter of time. And it didn't even matter. Except that I was hoping that if they killed any, any of us, they was going to kill us all and do it quick because I didn't want to see my kids suffer. They'd already, they'd already proven that they, you know, was willing to kill kids. They claim they're there for the, well, they'd send a hostage rescue team. That ain't no hostage rescue team. That's an FBI terrorist team is what it is. They're snipers. They put a name like hostage, Red. there were no hostages up there. Hostages don't pack guns. <laughs> they said you had booby traps and landmines. Oh, yeah. But they said a lot. They said I was wanted for robbing banks in Montana and Washington. They made up all kinds of garbage that wasn't true. But that way, see, they can justify to the public it's okay to kill us because we're all crazy and we're bad guys, right? That's why they do it. So why do you think some people were blaming Zog for what happened up on Ruby Ridge? Oh, I, I don't know. I suppose they figured that Zog controls the federal government and that that's who would come up there and ruined their lives, took some of our lives as the federal government. They have a lot of influence. The Zionists have a lot of influence. I mean, we give them $3 billion a year, you know. That Talking about Zionist Jews, there's like four different kinds of Jews. They ain't all bad. Some conspiracy theorists say that the demonization of Randy Weaver as a white supremacist is thematic of the New World Order's tactics, that they falsely accuse anyone of anti-Semitism who gets too close to the truth. Could this be true? One thing's for sure, in terms of Randy Weaver, the white supremacy angle was clearly working. Okay, let's talk about another civil rights issue, this Randy Weaver. He was in the Aryan nation. My neighborhood, if a guy put swastikas on his kids, I would be yeah. a little suspicious. Yeah. I would say, come on over, we'll have some fruit. <laughs> well, the government is saying, the order to the men in the field is, shoot to kill. And they, they kill shot the, to kill. They kill, they kill a dog. They kill the dog. Kill the dog, then they, they kill, kill the, the son, and they shot him in the back. <laughs> The next one they, they shot the him. dog in the back. Can you believe that, Gary? That, that is... Well, oh, man. That, that's a canine American. He's got his rights. That was the worst thing that happened. Listen, I think if you're going to error, I would like people to error to protect me and my family, not right. error... He wasn't to, causing and, any danger. This was a generating veteran... You know what? If you're bringing up your no kids in the Aryan right. nation, you are causing danger because you're spawning hate in America. So now you're, you're going to have... <laughs> They called me white supremacist. That's big news. That kind of stuff sells newspapers, I believe. Who wants to report on the ice cream social at the Methodist Church? 
that won't sell a damn thing. This is going to sell because this is exciting stuff. People go to car races to see wrecks. They don't go to watch people run in circles. They love blood and guts. People are cruel. <laughs> On the whole, I don't trust people. I think <laughs> it's been enough years now I can joke about it, you know, and have, keep going. I couldn't for a while. I can watch a western now. Again, you know, it's you know they got they have that the PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder they call it. I know we've all had it. Different to each of us to a different degree. Even Elisheba. Elisheba talked about that until she was two and a half years old. Blood, blood, mama and she started crying. Mama fall down, mama needs help. I mean she just make everybody in the room cry, you know. I haven't been watching the signs. Is anybody else? We might be going to Florida. <laughs> the siege at Ruby Ridge lasted for 10 days. Every morning, Bo and Jack would return up the mountain to talk to the family through the cabin walls. We're, we're, we're trying to calm them down, get them to stop crying, and to focus on something else other than their mother laying up underneath the kitchen table in a pool of blood. And so, the, basically, we spent the morning talking to them about the need to uh, uh, come out and take it to court. We knew then they had one fantastic case in court against this government. Oh my goodness. There's something in law enforcement called jury appeal. And when you machine gun a little boy running away from you and shoot a mother holding a baby in the head, you got jury appeal. It was 11 days into the siege that Bo and Jack finally convinced the family to take their case to court. Well, the door opens, and they come out. Ah, oh, I tell you, boy, I just about get tears in my eyes now thinking about it. It was wonderful to see these little girls take off their weapons, and little, little tiny little girls, you know, wearing weapons against their own government. I mean, where should that be proper? And it was uh, the saddest days of my life uh, was spent on the top of that mountain when I realized that my fellow police officers and soldiers are capable of that, you see, that I served with. I never would have believed that, never would have believed it, you know. And so it was a great awakening for Bo and me and many of the officers up there. Because when we walked down through that crowd, big guys with their military rifles and the tears coming down streaking the face paint, you know, they were all crying. You know that the family had come out so it was it was a great experience and that's why there's so many people today in america and people in uniform that are speaking out against this damnable world system that's being set up that will do that to people at will that's uh, me and president george bush some of the uh, fringe benefits that you get being in these positions. I've had the opportunity to meet many stars, and that's uh, me and Dolly Parton. Um, there's me and uh, President Ronald Reagan. Down here is a picture of uh, Randy Weaver when we brought him off the jet uh, shortly after we had taken custody of him. You know, in law enforcement, you, know, you always think that individual that you arrested was guilty. The jury chose another Avenue. And I don't have to agree with that, but in this country, uh, I have to respect it. In the end, Randy was charged with murder, conspiracy, and assault, but the trial was a disaster for the government. The judge said that the government had shown a callous disregard for the Weavers' rights. The government paid Rachel and her sisters a million dollars each in compensation. Nowadays, Randy earns a living by making personal appearances at gun shows with his new wife, Linda. <laughs> okay, this is the real Randy Weaver. What's happening, buddy? Two miles from the cabin is the Deep Creek Inn, where the family used to go for nights out. Rachel and I went there for supper. We were unaware that the resident guitarist had waited years to meet Rachel. My name is Dallas Pike, and I'm a storyteller. I've been living in Nashville for the last few years. I moved up here about a year ago. 
What happened to your family is the reason I came to Idaho. I have a feeling you may appreciate this song. Red stains in the snow, bloody rich Idaho. Red stains in the snow, bloody rich Idaho. A thousand meters is a long, long way. Never miss their bullets, never stray. Where's the justice and how do you appeal? No talking over the hard road feels when some buffalo hunter snaps a cap. How are you doing, sir? Good, how are you? What's your name? Bruce. Bruce, glad to meet you. This is my wife, Lynn, Bruce. Yes, sir. What's your name? E S S E N. Okay, back Thank out. you, Herman. Back out. Glad to meet you. That's my pleasure, believe me. Red stains in the snow. Vicky Weaver in Waco. But America died in a coup d'etat. It's back in Dallas that our freedom fell when some buffalo hunters and the FBI. Yeah, here, do it like it. Here. Well, sir. This is cute. <laughs> and look right into the lens so your eyes are <laughs> All right. I'll sign this here pretty All quick. Red stains in the snow. Too many names for us to know. What happened up there happened to a lot of people. It wasn't just you. And I can't tell you what an honor it is for me to meet you and to be able to play my song for you. I have touched a lot of people with this song. And I am truly sorry about what happened to your family. very last copy I have of this, and I'd like you to have it. I know that this is a very painful thing for you, and if there was anything I could do, I would. I'm sorry I can't do more, man. I really am. I don't know, I meet people like that every now and then, and it's, you know, mind if it kind of dissipated a little. I'm okay until I start hearing things like when he says Bloody Ridge, Idaho. It just reminds me of like seeing blood on the floor and, <sighs> and it makes me start thinking about it and I... Vicki Weaver was butchered like a buffalo, standing in the doorway of her own home, holding her baby and crying out to God to protect the rest of her family from the mad dogs that had already shot her son in the back from an ambush. With one bullet, Lon the hitman Horiuchi brought Vietnam to America. As Vicki Weaver started talking about the One World Order, and they just gunned her down because they could. So where are we going? Where are we going? Uh -huh. Waco, I think. <laughs> And what are we going to do when we get there? Well, we're going to talk to folks. We must be almost there, right? I'll bet we are. We'll probably recognize a new church building. Randy has never before visited the ruins of the Branch Davidian Church at Mount Carmel in Waco. But for hundreds of thousands of Americans, maybe even millions of Americans, the Weaver Siege and the burning of David Koresh's church are forever linked. Proof of a government gone crazy, a new world order coming to kill anyone who does not bow down to them. All the memorial trees. See the little placards, and the little headstones. Little one Jones, age one and a half. Unbelievable.
tell you what, boys, I wouldn't put that one on my place. I have no regrets about them. They was looking for trouble and they found it. Well, look at these boys. Are they growing up or what? How you doing, buddy? <laughs> He's about bigger than your dad. He did, man. <laughs> oh, he ain't been shot at lately. <laughs> <laughs> the things are looking up. <laughs> For six months, local volunteers have been spending their weekends rebuilding the church. It is nearly finished. Some conspiracy theorists say that the timing of the siege at Waco was no coincidence. They say it was a deliberate PR stunt designed to deflect the bad publicity they were getting for the shootings of Vicky and Sammy Weaver. She was standing right here, right in the window, holding it open, holding the baby, saying, get in the house, get in the house. And she was shot here? Yes. And you, and Perhaps it was no coincidence. It was six days into Randy Weaver's trial that the BATF announced that they were taking military action against a violent, child-abusing, gun-hoarding religious cult holed up in a compound in Texas. But if it was a PR stunt, it backfired. Fifty-three adults, including David Koresh, and 23 children were burnt to death here. They're the same people, the FBI, they're pretty bloodthirsty. Lon Horiuchi, the shooter, um, FBI sniper was right over there in that house. What, was Lon Horiuchi here? Yes, Lon Horiuchi was here. Yeah, I mean, these stories are all inter interconnected. See, those are sniper houses right over there. You didn't know Horiuchi was here, huh? Nope. Interesting. The FBI say they didn't know Vicki Weaver was behind the door when they fired into the cabin. They say her death was an accident and not the actions of a bloodthirsty government controlled by a shadowy elite called the New World Order. You are a federal officer, so Randy and Vicky Weaver would certainly have thought of you as being an agent of the New World Order, an agent of Zog. I mean, what, what does that... Well, I haven't lost any sleep over it, I'll tell you that. I mean, the United States is a great place to live. The freedoms that we have here and, you know, owning firearms and all of that. Um, there's, there's some certain set of rules and people can do all that. But then you have some other people that think they can go not just one step, but two steps, three steps, four steps over and, and, and pound the drums. And, and then you get a lot of followers. Who? What a mess. What can you say? Like, old material that Mom used to save. And some shoes. Lishba's baby chair. Broken pottery. My mom used to save all kinds of material and stuff for making blankets and clothes and... Rachel visits the remains of her cabin about twice a year. When she comes, she sometimes finds evidence of other visitors, pilgrims, who've been rummaging around their old belongings like archaeologists. Somebody's been up here on horses. One of the pilgrims was Timothy McVeigh, who visited Randy Weaver's cabin alone some months before blowing up the Alfred P. Moa building in Oklahoma City and killing 168 people. Timothy McVeigh considered the Moa building to be local New World Order headquarters. The Weavers moved to the mountains because of their fantasies about a shadowy elite coming to get them, and in a sense their conspiracy theories came true. The American militia movement was formed that week at the roadblock at Ruby Creek, convinced that a shadowy elite plans to do to the world what they did to the Weavers. This is the conspiracy theory I will examine throughout this series. Are you filming the crap? <laughs> it's a mess. I'd love to tear this down and burn it. You guys ready to head back? Or? Oh, I don't want to be late for dinner. <laughs> yep. Counting flowers on the wall That don't bother me at all Playing solitaire till dawn With the deck of 51 Smoking cigarettes and watching Captain Kangaroo, now don't tell me I've nothing to do.